Black Friday today is widely recognized as the start of the Christmas shopping season with deep discounts. However, the term has a darker history, and on the Great Lakes, the phrase refers to a horrendous storm that sank four boats on Lake Erie in 1916. It remains as the worst storm ever recorded on Lake Erie. On Wednesday, October 18, 1916, a Category 2 hurricane made landfall off the coast of Florida. After moving inland, it quickly weakened before converging with another low front over the Great Lakes the following day. As full gale warnings were being posted on the lakes, the steamer James B. Colgate was in Buffalo, New York, loading coal at the Lehigh Valley Dock. This unique-looking boat was called a whaleback, a class of experimental vessels designed in the late 1800s by Captain Alexander McDougall. The Colgate, in particular, was built in 1892 and measured 308 feet in length, 38 feet in beam, and 24 feet in depth. Whaleback's design allowed water to wash across its curved deck and flush hatch covers unimpeded, making them practically unsinkable. Since the Colgate first entered service, however, its hatch covers had been modified to allow for easier unloading with Hewlett unloaders. This change went against the fundamental design of the Whaleback. In command of the vessel was Captain Walter Grashaw. He had only been promoted to this position two weeks prior after serving as his first mate for the previous ten years. While the Colgate was being loaded, Grashaw told an assistant commissioner from the Lake Carriers Association, This breeze doesn't bother me a particle. This boat has a good belly full of coal in her now and is fit to face any sort of blow. It would take a mighty fair scale to stop her with this load in her. At 1.10 a.m. on October 20th, the vessel departed Buffalo and was en route to Fort William, Ontario. Upon leaving, they were immediately met with torrential waves and wind breaking across her deck. The worst had yet to come as conditions began to quickly deteriorate during the voyage. By mid-afternoon, Captain Grashaw ordered the four crew to move aft to the boat's main cabins in case they needed to launch the lifeboats. However, he still felt confident in his ship and continued on course. The ripping 70 mile per hour southwest winds greatly hindered their progress as the Colgate had only reached Long Point by around 6 to 7 o'clock. One hour later, the chief engineer reported that water was rapidly rising below deck. The crew investigated using the pilot house searchlight to look for damage. As the light beamed on the forward hull, it revealed that the hatch covers had been damaged by the pounding waves allowing water to enter its cargo holds. Before long, the bow was beginning to be pulled under the heavy seas. At approximately 10 p.m., James B. Colgate suddenly sank, leaving no time for the crew to launch lifeboats. Most jumped overboard just as the craft foundered. Standing on the pilot house bridge wing, Grashaw leapt clear of the ship as it slipped beneath the waters. The skipper briefly clung to one of the Colgate's 5 by 9 foot rafts after plunging into the frenzied seas. It flipped quickly, but Grashaw regained his grip after being washed away. Upon returning to the raft, he discovered two other sailors. Second engineer Henry Osman and a coal passer clinging to it for dear life. Throughout the rest of the night, the raft overturned several more times. During one flip, the coal passer let go due to exhaustion and was never seen again. In his final flip, both remaining men were thrown into the icy waters. Although Grashaw once again managed to pull himself back on, Osman was trapped underneath. He tried pulling him back onto the raft, however, Grashaw was weakened by the exertion. Osman eventually lost his grip as he slid back into the turbulent seas. For almost a day and a half, the captain drifted helplessly in Lake Erie. At 8.30 a.m. on October 22nd, he spotted the boat out in the distance heading in his direction. The skipper used his remaining strength to wave one of his arms at the vessel. The wheelsman of the car ferry Marquette and Bessemer No. 2, while on his route from Conneaut to Port Stanley, luckily spotted him off their port bow. After maneuvering the ferry alongside the raft, Grashaw was brought aboard by ladder. At the opposite end of the lake was the 360-foot bulk freighter Merida. This vessel, like the James B. Colgate, was also an experimental design. Built and launched from the yard of Frank Wheeler in West Bay City, Michigan in 1893, she originally had her engines amidships. The experiment didn't work out, and Merida was rebuilt as a traditional laker with its engines located aft. In early 1916, the ship was sold to the Valley Camp Steamship Company managed by Canadian shipping magnate James Playfair. Despite his Canadian management, Merida carried an American crew. On Friday, October 20th, the boat was heading from Fort William to Buffalo with a load of pyrite ore. 
The ship was last sighted 25 miles east of Southeast Shoal by the steamer Britain as it was diverting the Cedar Point to take shelter. Captain J.F. Massey noticed the Merida rolling dangerously and shipping massive waves over her bow. Despite the violent seas, the boat showed no signs of distress as it puttered along. Unbeknownst to Captain Harry Jones and Merida's crew of 22, they would pass the James B. Colgate mid-lake during the night before both ultimately foundered. Three hours behind the Merida was a lumber hooker Marshall F. Butters. Built in 1882, this 164 foot long wooden vessel could carry 700,000 linear feet of cordwood. During this particular voyage, the boat was carrying shingles and lumber from Georgian Bay to Cleveland. The Butters was 6 to 8 miles west of the Southeast Shoal lightship off Point Pelee, Ontario, when it encountered the gale shortly after noon. As the ship began to roll in the heavy seas, it was discovered that they were taking on water. With the hurricane force winds and rising waters, the heavy cargo on deck shifted, making the boat list to starboard. Captain Charles McClure ordered the pumps and siphons turned on and had the boat spun into the trough of the waves. In an effort to save his vessel and crew, lumber began being tossed overboard to try and lighten their load. Despite the valiant efforts of the chief engineer, mate, wheelsman, steward, and firemen, water continued to gain on them. Around 1.50 p.m., the boat's boilers were extinguished by the incoming water. McClure knew they were out of time. Fortunately for them, the freighter Frank Billings was spotted about five miles leeward, and Captain McClure blew a distress signal on the butter's whistle. However, its sound was drowned out by the roaring winds. He tried a few more times, and luckily, Billings' watchmen noticed the extra steam coming out of its whistle. The lookout notified Captain Fabian Cody of the trouble and set a course to render assistance at 2 p.m. Another nearby freighter, the Fred G. Hartwell, saw the commotion and also diverted from his course to help. The Butters, now helpless in the seas, was battered by the tremendous waves and howling winds. The remaining lumber and shingles on deck were being lifted and hurled through the air into the water. As the two freighters approached, McClure ordered the crew to abandon ship. Eight of the 13 crew members launched a boat on the starboard side and made for the Hartwell. It took them nearly 20 minutes to row through the gale to reach it. Meanwhile, the last five crew members stayed behind on the Butters. Shortly after, the boat began to sink and three men jumped overboard into the littered waters. Frank Billings poured down the storm oil and circled the ship twice to rescue them. Back on deck, Charles McClure was stuck in some lumber and freed by fireman George Paul. The two took to a yawl boat and made their way safely to the Billings. Astonishingly, some of the images you're seeing are actual pictures of the butters sinking taken by second engineer Herman Smock. One of the most terrifying stories from that storm comes from the wooden barge D.L. Filer. The Filer was built in 1871 as a three-massive schooner for the lumber trade. It was later converted into a barge in 1898 after it was sunk and raised off Racine, Wisconsin. On Wednesday, October 18, 1916, the D.L. Filer was loaded with coal and buffalo and under the tow of the steamer Tempest, along with another barge, the Interlaken. While en route to Saugatuck, Michigan, they encountered the brewing storm near the western end of Lake Erie. The Tempest let the Filer's tow line go about 10 miles from the mouth of the Detroit River. As the steamer sought refuge at Toledo, the barge's crew cast off its anchors and tried to ride out the storm. Battling a continually increasing gale, they kept at the pumps night and day. The pounding waves pushed the barge for six miles while dragging her anchors. Around 9 p.m., the vessel grounded three miles off the coast of Bar Point, Ontario, and began taking on water. Captain John Madison ordered the six crew members to climb the boat's rigging shortly before foundering in 18 feet of water. The six men clung to the foremast for an hour in the dark until it snapped under their weight, hurling them into the turbulent waters. Oscar Johansson swam to the aftermast where Captain Madison was perched and grabbed his outstretched hand, assisting him in climbing the rigging. The two grasped the remaining mass until daylight the next day when the passenger steamer Western States sighted them. A yawl boat was sent out to rescue them, but before it reached the men, Johansson succumbed to weakness and fell into Lake Erie. As the lifeboat got closer, Madison let go of the mast and safely swam towards it. He had been in that precarious position for 12 hours. The DL Filer was the first of the four shipwrecks located on the bottom of Lake Erie. Its coal cargo was salvaged just weeks after its sinking. According to some sources, the wreck was removed at some point because it was a navigational hazard. Others, however, claim that it has not been formally identified. 
1975, the steamer Merida was discovered in 80 feet of water 25 miles east of Erie, Ontario. The James B. Colgate, though, would not be found until 1991, about 8 miles southwest of Erie. Wreck hunters also discovered the Marshall F. Butters 10 miles east of Southeast Shoal that same year. Captain Charles McClure passed away four years after the sinking of the Marshall Butters. According to newspapers, he never fully recovered physically. Captain Walter Grashaw of the Colgate would go on to command other whalebacks before he died in 1928. Captain John Madison eventually retired from sailing and established his own dairy business in Muskegon, Michigan. He died in 1961 at the ripe age of 83. A total of 53 sailors were lost on Black Friday. Despite being overshadowed by many other Great Lakes disasters, it remains one of the most infamous storms in Great Lakes history.